Hi, I'm Sunil Yu, and I'm the creator of the Cyber Defense Matrix. The Cyber Defense Matrix is a model that I created to help navigate the cybersecurity landscape, and I think it has some applicability for some of the challenges that we see in healthcare. A little bit about me before we get started. So I'm currently the CISO and head of research at Jupyter One. Jupyter One is a startup that is building a cloud-native cyber asset management and governance solution. Before Jupyter One, I was the Chief Security Scientist at Bank of America. And while there, I had the opportunity to serve in a couple different roles. Uh, one of them was to be a mad scientist, where I had a chance to build a lot of uh, interesting and new crazy capabilities. Aside from building capabilities, I also was the um, a main person that was in charge of looking at new startups and testing those capabilities to see whether or not the, all the claims that they make actually, um, uh, whether they actually work. And then lastly, I was uh, I had a chance to be a red team lead, lead where I got a chance to break a lot of things. Now, in my role as a product evaluator of a lot of different startups, um, I faced a an immediate challenge, which was just trying to dissect through all the buzzwords that they throw at me to understand, one, what they do, and two, to see whether or not it actually meets the need that I have. Well, w one, of the ch uh, one of the responsibilities I had as the chief security scientist was to uh, developed a technology roadmap for the organization. Well, to be able to do that, you have to understand where you have gaps, right? But when you just stare at a bunch of buzzwords like you see here, it's hard to find a gap because what you see is all there is. If I were to ask you what's missing out of here, it, you would have a hard time just because uh, it, it requires you to have to dissect every word here and understand what might, what might be missing. So I needed a better, more structured approach. And as, a, as uh, in my attempt to come up with a more structured approach, I came up with, again, something I call the cyber defense matrix. The cyber defense matrix, uh, it, at its core, consists of two dimensions. On one dimension, it's the things that I care about, these five asset classes, devices, applications, networks, data, and users. On the other dimension, it's the five functions of the NIST cybersecurity framework. Identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. When we bring these two dimensions into a five by five grid, we get what I call the cyber defense matrix. And the cyber defense matrix provides a 50,000 foot strategic view of the entire cybersecurity landscape. It provides a view that helps us understand where we might have gaps in our program, where we need to go, um, where some of the uh, where our capabilities fall, uh, all the things that we need to do to run a mature and robust cybersecurity program. What you also see on the bottom is something that uh, I've conjecture or assert uh, depicts the degree of dependency that we have on people, process, and technology as we go across the five functions of the NIST cybersecurity framework. So uh, when it comes to the functions of identify and protect, we should largely rely upon technology to do the work there. As we move to detect, respond, and recover, what I have found is that uh, despite whatever technologies that come our way, we still have a very, uh, uh, we're heavily dependent upon people to do a lot of the work on the right side of boom. Boom, by the way, is between protect and detect. And on the right side of boom, uh, it, it tends to be that we need uh, people to do a lot of the work there. Throughout all five functions, we have a equal amount of dependence on process, meaning uh, we always have a need for process throughout uh, all the five functions. It's not something that we should uh, disregard. So uh, to be able to test the cyber defense matrix then, I would want to take all of those buzzwords that we saw previously and see whether or not I can find a home for each one of these buzzwords. right? And for, uh, for the most part, I was able to do that. I was able to take a lot of those buzzwords and fit them in. And in doing so, I can see, for example, what the buzzwords mean uh, in relation to the function and the asset class where it's trying to perform some security function. It also allows me to see adjacencies. It lets me see gaps as well, uh, potentially in the marketplace. Now, just because there's a word in uh, one of these boxes doesn't necessarily mean that all the, the individual functions within uh, the five functions of the NIST cybersecurity framework are actually being performed. So uh, again, it's a 50,000 foot view, and as you get lower into the 25,000 and 10,000 and 5,000 foot view, 
um, as you see more granularity and start seeing more ta a tactical view of the landscape, uh, we'll see more gaps emerge just because uh, there's only so much you can see at this sort of scale. Now, the cyber defense matrix, uh, I wanted to find an easy way to put it into practice or help people put it into practice. So I came up with an approach that I call the stack. And the stack uh, is, uh, I, I use uh, a food analogy when describing the stack because, well, we all have to eat food, so hopefully it's something that everyone can relate to. The stack uses the cyber defense matrix as a foundation. And then we, what we are going to do is to, uh, to map various layers. And these layers consist of different parts of how we uh, make food. Okay, so the first layer is a recipe. Um, these are proven practices. These are frameworks. These are uh, architectures that we have to abide by. And this represents the things that we have to do, um, the kind of requirements that we have to meet to, to have a robust cybersecurity environment. The next layer is our pantry. Basically, what do you have today in your uh, existing portfolio capabilities that can help secure your environment? The third layer is the market. So what can you find in the grocery store? What can, what's available from vendors to help you uh, meet to, to uh, fulfill the recipe that you're trying to, trying to make? Now, we can't, uh, not everyone can eat every kind of food. Likewise, within a business, um, not everyone can uh, adhere to all the security controls that we want to uh, implement. So we have to somehow capture business constraints and exceptions and things that will cause impact to the business. And so these allergies is, a, uh, is something that we also want to capture in the matrix as well. And then lastly, we want to capture nutritional needs. And this represents the risks that we see in our environment, the attack surfaces, the threats, the vulnerabilities that uh, uh, can potentially harm us. And the combination of these then is what I call the stack. What we're going to do is to um, uh, map each of these different layers to the cyber defense matrix and I'll show you how we might go about doing that. In doing so, we should be able to answer these three questions. How secure are we? And uh, to answer that question, we would look at our existing capabilities. Next, how secure should we be? And here we're looking at proven practices plus the risks that we have to address. And then lastly, how do we get there? And for this, we're going to look at what's available in the market, plus uh, be mindful of the constraints that we have to deal with. And my hope is that we can uh, take this approach. Uh, I've used this approach for enterprise security, but my hope is that we can use a similar type of approach to help us address some of the challenges that we see in healthcare. So first, Let's look at our pantry. Um, now, if you're trying to do enterprise security, there's a lot of capabilities that are at our disposal. Um, unfortunately, though, I think when it comes to healthcare, many of those capabilities don't exist. And so we um, have to be mindful that our pantry may be a little bit more thin for healthcare. Uh, and, and also, just understanding what's available for the enterprise security market gives us a, a template, if you will, to say, hey, why, why don't we have some of these capabilities for healthcare? Let's uh, find investment to be able to build some of these capabilities out. So capturing the existing capabilities, um, that's, that's a representation of how secure we are. Let's now move to the proven practices. One of the ways that uh, uh, proven practices are articulated is through the CIS controls. Um, as of version 7, actually, they already map directly to the cyber defense matrix. So if you look at version 7 and the more recently released version 8, you'll see that there's actually already a mapping to the cyber defense matrix. Uh, I, I'm not a healthcare expert and um, I haven't worked in healthcare before, but uh, I'm not sure to what degree the CIS controls can apply to um, healthcare environments, but I suspect that a good amount of it can overlap or can be applied uh, in those environments. So. Um, but nonetheless, I think it's important to recognize that not everything's going to fit exactly. But uh, it, the CIS controls, at least, is a starting point to be able to say, here are controls that we, sh we can implement. But not only that, here's a, here's a set of controls that we can implement in a certain priority order. So uh, we should do number one first before we do number two, number two before we do number three, and so on and so forth. Um, so anyway, the CIS controls provides uh, an example of how we take 
this notion of recipes and map it directly to the cyber defense matrix. Again, the uh, CIS has already mapped it to the matrix, so the work's already been done for you. Um, and this gives you a sense of the controls that you would need to implement for each of these boxes, as well as the priority order that you would follow. So we've captured existing capabilities, we've captured uh, proven practices, and to be able to answer the rest of the question on how secure we should be, let's also look at risks. And to that end, the cyber defense matrix provides a, a way that we can actually visualize um, our risk and attack surfaces and vulnerabilities and so on and so forth. So here's an example of how we can look at attack surfaces. If I look at a traditional three-tier three web application, there's a lot that I need to secure. I need to secure the server, I need to secure the application, I need to secure the network, I still need to secure the data. And when we consider all that I need to secure and the attack surfaces associated with it, um, we, we can see that there's a lot of controls that are needed. Compare that to, let's say, a serverless function where um, I can remove much of my attack surface or at least transition the risks associated with that to the provider that's providing the serverless function. But ultimately, it gives me a visual depiction of, uh, of a path that I want to encourage others to take, which is I want to move from uh, this traditional three-tiered architecture to one that actually has a reduced attack surface. And the reduced attack surface is something that gives us uh, an opportunity to be more secure because we're building on uh, more defensible infrastructure that has fewer attack surfaces. Just being able to visualize this, I think, is a powerful uh, way to uh, help our partners and stakeholders move to uh, more defensible infrastructure overall. And it allows us to understand, uh, again, what controls can be uh, maybe needed to be able to address some of the risks that we see. Another mapping that uh, I'm sure you guys, or another um, uh, mechanism, another tool that I'm sure many of you all are familiar with is the MITRE ATT&CK framework that uh, characterizes a lot of the TTPs that we see attackers uh, following. Um, and if we look closely at the MITRE ATT&CK framework, um, you'll see that there's also uh, um, specific asset classes that are represented in the TTPs. So not everything, um, um, or many of the uh, TTPs that you see in the MITRE ATT&CK framework tend to be device-oriented, attacking things like your workstation and Windows and so on and so forth. But there are other uh, TTPs in the attack framework that map to uh, an attack against an application or an attack against an, uh, a network or data or users. Uh, within each of the TTPs, there's also additional information in terms of um, how would you find these attacks? How would you know that an attack occurred or one of these TTPs um, were used? And so it captures information like what data sources you need. It also captures information on what protective mitigations you might want to put in place. And if you're not familiar with the Cyber Analytic Repository, or CAR, uh, car.mitre.org, um, it also provides uh, the analytic approach or method, the logic to be able to look for these attacks within one's environment. And what I've done here is to be able to just map each of those different uh, types of information to the different asset classes that are within the cyber defense matrix. So that maps um, the, the, the attack surfaces and the risks that we see in our environment and, and to be able to characterize how secure we should be. Lastly, we want to understand how do we get there. And to that, to that end, let's look at market capabilities. So what sort of vendors are out there? Now, it, I, I uh, try to do my best here to um, find uh, vendors that are uh, specialized towards the healthcare market. Um, and it seems relatively small. Uh, now, uh, again, I, I don't know the mint market as well. Um, and so if I make a mistake here or if I left somebody out, you know, please forgive me. Uh, I'm not endorsing any of these vendors. In fact, the ones that you, you see here are really based on how easily I could find their logo. <laughs> so. Um, uh, yeah, I'm sure I'm missing plenty of vendors out there. And the mapping itself, again, um, it's based on what I could dissect in the marketing language that I see in the vendor website. But nonetheless, I think overall, you can still see that there's interesting concentrations and gaps as well. Uh, in interesting uh, concentrations in that there's a ton of companies that are helping to identify uh, the presence of medical devices. but. Uh, a lot of the other places are a bit weaker in terms of uh, being able to uh, perform the various functions that you see in the, in the in the cyber defense matrix. 
by the way, uh, also, if there's plenty of vendors who will come to me and say, hey, no, I do X, Y, and Z. Um, there's a distinction that I want to make between I do something versus I support something. So there are uh, capabilities where uh, a particular vendor will definitively do something uh, associated with, let's say, identifying devices. But oftentimes, they may not necessarily protect them. Rather, they will enable something else to protect that device. Um, and so it requires a bit of uh, uh, synthesizing or just dissecting the wording of, of the, um, uh, the marketing details. Uh, but that, that's an important facet of understanding how to use this matrix properly, to understand the primary function of a uh, particular vendor product and a secondary one. The secondary one uh, or a second order function tends to require another first order capability to be in place. And that's something that the cyber defense matrix also helps us um, understand and navigate as well. So that's the market capabilities. And then lastly, we want to understand constraints. And to that end, um, if we had our own way, we could pro if, if security folks could have our own way, we might want to actually implement, I think we may want to implement all of these controls that we have available to us. But uh, that may not necessarily be the most wise or cost efficient. Um, I, a lot of people look at the cyber defense matrix as a bingo card. Uh, you, can, you can see why that's the case. Uh, but our goal in security isn't always to play blackout. We, we don't necessarily need to um, check all the boxes on here. What we want to be able to do is to be able to declare bingo by um, filling in just enough boxes that uh, satisfy satisfies our risk tolerance for the, uh, for the environment. And oftentimes, uh, some of these boxes we may not be able to check because they, they it create some sort of business impact. There's some sort of allergy associated with implementing a certain control here or there. To be able to capture that uh, systematically, the cyber defense matrix, again, provides a great organizing framework to be able to uh, see uh, what controls um, we have, but also where we have, uh, um, uh, we, where we need to consider the the uh, business impact that may come from implementing a certain set of controls. In certain environments, we may have no constraints at all. So, for example, in a call center, uh, we can implement whatever controls we want. But again, like I said, we may not want to because uh, it's expensive, and uh, for the, for the particular environment that we're dealing with, uh, it, we may be willing to accept some degree of risk. Um, and not have to implement every possible control that we, even even if we could implement every possible control, uh, it just may not be cost effective based on the the uh, risk exposure that we might have. In other cases, uh, we may not be able to uh, implement a sufficient amount of security controls because it creates a business some some degree of business impact. And ultimately, what we want to be able to do is to uh, have a systematic mechanism where we can capture those conflicts, those uh, trade-offs, risk, those risk management trade-offs where we're saying uh, we're willing to, to forego a certain set of uh, security controls even though we want to uh, implement them or need to implement them because it's going to create some business impact. Or alternatively, uh, when we implement a certain set of security controls that does create business impact, at least we're, knowing, we're doing it knowing that it's going to create some business impact and we've negotiated that and discussed that with uh, other stakeholders where they're willing to accept that business impact as well. Um, an example of this in the uh, financial services environment would be something like uh, uh, high-speed trading. So um, uh, high-speed trading, if you put a firewall in there, you might as well close business because um, you know, it's all, all predicated on being able to get information very quickly. And so uh, we may have a, a security requirement to put a firewall in place but we, we know that that's going to create some uh, significant business impact, and so we forego the use of the firewall. But there may be other compensating controls or other mitigating controls. What we want to be able to do systematically as a community is to be able to capture these constraints for these different types of uh, user environments or different types of um, uh, uh, business environments and be able to say, okay, consider uh, there are alternative design patterns that helps us still increase the security posture or address the, the security challenges that we might have for that particular environment without creating business impact. I, I'm sure that um, you, uh, in, in pretty much every organization, you have some sort of sales and marketing team where you have some set of developers or analysts. Um, we oftentimes are recreating the wheel every time as we learn 
how to work within these environments uh, by creating a set of controls uh, without creating distance impact. The the uh, this understanding and this this um, these design patterns that we come up with. Uh, what I'm hoping we can do with the cyber defense matrix is to find a way to uh, to um, consistently capture in these design patterns and these things that we learn so that we don't have to always keep recreating it uh, and also be able to improve upon it over time as well. So now I've mapped each of these layers to the cyber defense matrix and in doing so we can now uh, see how each of these layers can help us answer the question of how secure are we, um, how secure should we be, and how do we get there. And what we want to do is to then combine these five layers. And in doing so, um, we can actually understand our overall decision space and the range of risk management options that we have in front of us. So um, in combining these, we can then say there are a couple areas, for example, um, right here, where it may be just table stakes, uh, adjust to it sort of opportunity. So in this particular situation right here, we have uh, a uh, proven practice that we know we should implement. There are commercial capabilities available. There's an active uh, risk issue that's here, but we just don't have any existing capabilities and there's no business constraints that limit our ability to implement a control. So that will be a situation where we could just do it. There's no nothing really uh, stopping us. Conversely, let's look at this situation over here where uh, it's a similar sort of circumstance uh, with a proven practice, with commercial capabilities available with a, um, an active risk here as well. But there is a mission constraint or some business constraint. And so in those situations, what we want to be able to do is to recognize that um, uh, that there is some business impact that may occur if you implement some control. Um, but ultimately, it's a discussion that we need to have with the business to say, do we want to uh, uh, address this issue? Um, uh, do we want to forego it and accept the risk associated with it? Are there other opportunities to mitigate that control by putting in controls elsewhere? All right. Now, um, what I've showed you is the uh, these five layers uh, is a starting point for how I look at uh, using the cyber defense matrix. But we can go beyond even and in capturing additional information that um, uh, helps us uh, further develop and mature our security program. So think of the initial um, um, five things that we talked about before as um, creating the food, right? Now it's a question of how good does it taste um, or how uh, cost effective is it? Um, and so what we want to be able to do is capture measurements here. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the cyber defense matrix is a great organizing construct. And we can organize lots of inter interesting information uh, into the matrix here. And so here's an example of how we can uh, organize, for example, the, the metrics and measurements that we have associated with our program, as well as how much we're spending uh, associated with each of the different buckets or each of the different capabilities that we see in the cyber defense matrix. What I'm showing here is just a, a, a range of different things that we could potentially capture and organize into the cyber defense matrix. Measurement is a really hard challenge for many of us. Um, and I would offer, there's a couple different levels of measurement that we can use to um, to capture, uh, to, to understand our security program and th then subsequently be able to capture it. Some of the measurements are easier, some of them are harder. Um, easier ones are gonna be just, do we even have the capability all, at all? Do we have a firewall, for example? Um, it's like saying, do we have a vaccine? The next level would be, um, is the firewall turned on? Okay, has, has we, have we actually opened the vaccine vial? The next one would be, um, are we actually turning on the features associated with the firewall? So uh, number two can be, yes, we have a firewall, but it's just, it has an any, any rule. Um, number three would be, we've actually put in specific ACLs into the firewall. And then number four is, well, okay, great. You have a firewall, you have some product, you have some capability. How well does it actually work in, in dealing with the threats that we see? And then lastly, um, is a cost, uh, we, we introduce cost, which is ultimately um, how cost effective is it uh, relative to the security benefit that we're getting. Uh, each of these different, there, there's again, different levels of difficulty in getting these values. Uh, and I don't expect any organization to have all these values, but we oftentimes have some of these values, but don't really have a great home for it. 
And what I would propose is, is that the cyber defense matrix at least provides us a place to organize this information, put it in a place where we can see it relative to uh, other bits of information, and just be able to methodically uh, improve upon uh, what we already have today once it's organized in this fashion. Now, the cyber defense matrix, um, I, I just showed you uh, really just a small handful of, of uh, use cases. My original use case, uh, as I mentioned, was just to map vendors. But uh, back in 2016, I showed a whole bunch of other use cases, uh, which I, I'm not really presenting here. But if you wanted to dig further into some of these, feel free to look at the link here, and you'll see some of the use cases that, uh, that uh, I presented then. And in 2019, I gave an update to that as well with a ton of other use cases. At this point in time, I have roughly about 50-some use cases, um, which would take me too long to go through uh, in this session. But nonetheless, uh, it's a rich, uh, it's a very um, uh, interesting framework that we can use to uh, understand our space better and to be able to find ways that we can um, uh, improve the security posture of our, of our environment. As I mentioned, I used this at the Bank of America. I've used it since then to be able to understand the space better and to um, uh, create new use cases. I think it has a lot of applicability for healthcare, especially since um, we're, some of the problems that we're seeing in healthcare, we've already addressed in the enterprise security space. The enterprise security space, in fact, provides a template for what the healthcare um, side needs to also address as well. So why not use what we learned and the structures and the the approaches and the, um, uh, and understand how that can be used to help guide investment and areas for investigation. And with that, um, uh, if you have any additional questions or want to get additional information about the cyber defense matrix, here's how to contact me. And uh, I hope that um, you find the cyber defense matrix useful. If you have any use cases that you come up with or you wanted to offer any feedback on what you saw, please, please feel free to reach out. Thank you very much.